Uh, yes, so thank you for um, uh, your support and organizing a wonderful event, giving me the opportunity to speak, and um, thanks also, Susanna, for setting this up very nicely. So Carlo made this point about um, uh, the necessary dissipation of, uh, uh, or the, the necessity of dissipation in order to perform a measurement, and that is exactly the, the topic of this talk. So um, I hope by the end, although some may be ripe to believe this already, to convince you that the value of um, trying to understand the process of measurement, that is the acquisition of information, um, to understand this as a, as a thermodynamic or perhaps more precisely a statistical f physical phenomenon. Um, so this leads on from the, the idea of information as fuel by instead asking the question, uh, what kind of fuel and, and how much do I need to burn in order to acquire some information in the first place? Um, so this is the, then the presentation of the first steps along that road, uh, which I believe to be a very promising one. Um, it was in the pub last night. It was uh, it, I was encouraged to um, say at the beginning. Sorry, is everything okay? Adrian? Yeah. I, I was uh, encouraged to ask at the beginning uh, you all to, to um, uh, ask yourselves the question as I talk about this: which interpretation of quantum mechanics, if any, underlies what I'm about to say? So we'll come back to that at the end if there's time. Um, this is based on um, uh, joint work with my wonderful collaborators, uh, Manu Schwarzhans, Felix Binder, who's in the audience here and um, Marcus Huber. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a story which we've all heard before and we all, uh, I believe, we all know to be incomplete, but I think we perhaps disagree on the exact manner in which it is incomplete. So I think by starting with the story, then perhaps we can have some sort of common shared ground in our, in our disbelief of it or our belief in its incompleteness, and then we can sort of move on from there. So, you know, you open your, your sort of introductory or undergraduate textbook on quantum mechanics, you'll find uh, a description of two kinds of evolutions. One, uh, a sort of continuous unitary evolution, perhaps a CPTP map if, you, if the textbook goes far enough to describe open systems and master equations. Um, and then suddenly, when you want to acquire some information from the system, Bob, you have this, um, this sudden uh, discrete uh, uh, measurement, either, either modeled by a projection or more generally by a POVM. So just to be absolutely concrete here, you have some, some state, which may be in a superposition, and then this instantaneously collapses from the superposition to one of the two outcomes. Um, and this is often, you, you may have seen this um, very nice cartoon before by Zurich, um, showing this idea of that you have some sort of quantum, fuzzy, indeterminate world, and then somehow at some point you show your classical apparatus, and then bam, suddenly we have a, something that we can all agree on somehow. Um, and there are many problems with this. So uh, many measurement problems, you might say. Uh, so one is the question of how a particular measurement outcome is chosen. Uh, I think this is a very interesting question, but I don't really know how to physically well define this question. So uh, people may disagree, but for me, this is still a philosophical question until, until I can find a way to, 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 to turn it into something sort of perhaps more concrete. Another um, problem one might have, or another question that arises, is how do we choose which situation should be modeled in the continuous fashion and which in, the, in this discrete fashion? Which, which should be modeled by unitary processes and which by projectors, say? One way of making this question concrete is saying, uh, this is a formulation due to Chaslav Bruckner at Akoki. If you have a, an optical table, say, and, a, and a, a, a beam path, you're sending photons along some particular line, and you're placing elements in this beam path, how do you know as a theorist, if I place this element, this should be modeled by a unitary, and this other element should be modeled by some kind of projection? Under which physical criteria, which physical criteria am I going to use in order to make this decision? So these are, these are the, perhaps the more famous measurement problems, but there are less famous ones, which, in my opinion, are kind of worse, right? And that is a measurement, a projective measurement, it breaks all three laws of thermodynamics. So firstly, uh, energy conservation. You, once you perform this project, let's say, okay, let's say we have some initial state rho, measurement basis let's represent by zero and one, just to be concrete, we get the outcome one. Well, whatever our initial state is, generally speaking, it's gonna have a different energy from, from the one state. First law of thermodynamics is broken. The entropy of the initial state, let's say von Neumann entropy in this case, is in general greater than the entropy of your final state. Second law of thermodynamics is broken. The third one, which people who don't study, who aren't so interested in thermodynamics might be a little less uh, uh, clear. Um, if, if I have somehow projected from this arbitrary initial state rho to some final state, all I need to do is some finite time, finite energy unitary, and I've rotated to the ground state. So now I've been able to cool down perfectly in finite time at finite energy. So. The laws of thermodynamics, sorry guys, but apparently they don't work, right? 
You all believe that? No, you don't. Um, just to sort of give a shout out, this was discussed a little bit, particularly leaning on the third point one, the, the issue of um, the breaking of the third law in this very nice paper by um, my friends and collaborators, Jelena, Nico, and uh, Marcus here. So um, to kind of round off this point, I found this very nice quote by Arthur Eddington. He says, it's a much longer quote, but paraphrasing a little, it says, if someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. And yet quantum mechanics has not collapsed in deepest humiliation. It's in fact the most successful theory that we have so far. So what gives? Well, I said that the story I'm telling you is incomplete, and I think you will know that. Of course, this textbook straw man that I'm setting up is just that, it's a straw man, it's a lie. None of us really believe this. What's really happening? Well, okay, now is the part where we, I think maybe we might start to disagree, but I think it's not too much of a leap to try to imagine measurement as a dynamical process. I mean, uh, Susanna gave this very nice, um, um, sorry, there you are. <laughs> Susanna gave this very nice um, uh, definition of information, which I, I think is a good working definition of information, namely the correlations be between systems, correlations between perhaps some agent, some observer, and the system that you're trying to measure, right? So then, if we want to model this in a more realistic sense, we need a dynamical model of the generation of these correlations. So let's, you know, let's do that. And I mean, by, by let's do that, I mean let's look at this 1930s textbook by John von Neumann while the ink was still drying on quantum mechanics, who already was talking about this point. Um, so you, you say, you know, I have some, my system, this system which may be in some superposition of these states, let's call them 0 and 1, and then some pointer system, and then via some unitary process here, I'm going to couple these two together so that I can now correlate the state of my pointer with the state of my system. Um, and this, this is something that can be useful. Uh, you look like you have a question. Would you, would you like to interject or...? Um, this is an assumption, it's not a, it's not a piece of knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a lot of... Concretely. <laughs> concretely you, I mean, you don't, uh, but uh, I don't know. I, th I, I don't like slippery slope arguments, but I feel like this is a slippery slope to superdeterminism if you don't allow yourself to be uncorrelated. But at the same time, no, one, on the one hand... Right, everything is correlated with everything, but <laughs> through the monogamy of entanglement, at least if we talk about entanglement, that kind of tells you that if everything is correlated with everything, then any one thing is not really correlated with any other one thing, unless you have reason to believe otherwise. Um, but, so, okay, so if we, but if, this, is, this is nice, this is a start, but if we take this seriously, what are we really saying? If this is what measurement is, what are we really saying the world looks like in this picture? Well, we're saying we start with some, say, in some superposition, say zero and one, and then we have some points that we couple with a specific unitary applied for a specific time corresponding to a specific energy such that this, becomes perfectly correlated with some pointer state, and we do the same again with some other. Let's make this concrete. Let's talk about the stern gerlach apparatus, right? So you have your inhomogeneous magnetic field, your, your spin half particle, your silver atom in the, in the case of the original experiment. You couple your spin to your momentum, so the pointer state here would be the, your, now your momentum state, uh, and then your, this, this uh, 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 spin is going to fly in two different directions, interact with two detectors. Those detectors have cables. The cable is coupled to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we really want to uh, follow this chain of logic and say that this is really what a measurement is, what we're saying, like, let's say for one reason or another I've made a bet, say, on the, on the spin being up, then, then we're going to need uh, 10 to the 27, approximately, I'm using the number of particles in my body as a, as a sort of stand-in for the number of degrees of freedom, 10 to the 27 unitaries to get from the spin being in the superposition, this initial state, to me being happy because I, I lost the bet and, or, and me being sad because I lost the bet being somehow correlated with, this, with the information that's contained in this system. So if you follow this picture through, you're demanding way, way too much control. So perhaps it's a part of the, the, the uh, answer to this thermodynamic puzzle, but it's clearly not the whole answer, right? Um, but this is, this is a very stringent requirement. So what's a less stringent requirement? Well, one example is quantum Darwinism. There, you don't demand this uh, exact, uh, uh, exact perfect correlation uh, stepwise between many, many different degrees of freedom. Instead, you model the world as this system surrounded by some kind of environment, and you, and you make the, 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 the demand that the mutual information between the system and any fraction of the environment, this Fe here represents the environment, I, this I here is the mutual information, should, as you increase the fraction that you consider, this mutual information, that is to say the, the me a measure of the correlations that are shared across two, two parties, as you increase the fraction of the environment that you consider, this mutual information should very, very quickly increase 
and uh, quickly saturate at the so-called classical plateau, as, the, as Zurich calls it in, in quantum Darwinism, where you've now acquired all of the information. HS here is the entropy associated with the system, uh, informational entropy associated with the system. You've somehow saturated this. You've acquired all of the information that, you've, that you need about the measurement very quickly as you consider uh, uh, the, an increasing fraction of the, of the environment. So this is, this is an interesting idea, but it's a statement about the state space. It's not a dynamical model of measurement. It doesn't, still doesn't resolve the issue. Um, another interesting uh, uh, line of reasoning in this, let's say, is this notion, it's the, the, the name for this in the literature is objectivity. I think that's a misnomer, really. I would call it intersubjectivity, but I'm going to continue using the word objectivity because that's what it's called in the literature. Um, but this, so this was a set of criteria um, uh, laid out in this paper here, and the, the, the whole um, objectivity or intersubjectivity approach is very nicely summarized if you're interested in this review by Corbett, which I recommend, uh, Corbett. Um, so what is, what is this thing? It's, it's the, the statement that multiple observers can simultaneously access and independently determine the measurement outcome, that they can do so without disturbing the system, so-called Born non-disturbance criterion, and that they will come to the same result. And what these authors showed is that actually, the next slide contains uh, a lot of information, but I'll break it down, is that actually dem making these demands encoded in the way they encode, which one may w wish to argue about, uh, one is necessarily led to a, st uh, a form of the state, uh, uh, which is the following. So let me break this down, because there's a lot of information on one slide. First of all, we assume a Hilbert space divided into some collection of observers and the system of interest. Um, and then you have the, the um, measurement outcomes labeled by I here, each one correspondent with some associated outcome probability. Um, so now we can, we can break down what this actually says. It says that your, your system is in a, super, uh, a classical mixture of correlated states across your, the system of interest being in, say, the state I, and then the observe, each observer having some conditional state, rho, rho ki, where k labels the observer, and those conditional states are such that the fidelity between them is zero. So in an information theoretic context, one would, one would say that in, if you're given a state, uh, if you're tasked with playing like a state, dis state discrimination game between any two of these conditional states, you would be able to do so, play this game with 100% uh, with success probability. In, in short, these, these different worlds, if you like, or different outcomes or different branches or whatever are, are classically distinguishable. That's, the, that's what this fidelity demand here um, uh, encodes. So uh, as was shown in this nice, nice paper by um, Tao Le and, um, uh, and Alaya Castro, uh, this condition, this objectivity condition, spectrum, which is equivalent to this spectrum broadcast structure of the state, um, implies quantum Darwinism. Um, and in fact, if you take a much stronger form of quantum Darwinism, then this is equivalent to this, to this um, state structure. But OK, once again, this is a statement about state space. This is not a dynamical model that shows how we go from quantum superpositions in general to objective facts or intersubjective facts in a way that is spontaneous and irreversible and does not require the exact control of all the constituents. Well, you can probably see where I'm going with this, right? What do we know that is, what, which physical process do we know that is spontaneous and irreversible and does not require exact control of all the constituents? It's the process of equilibration. It's the process of entropy increasing. So with this, we take the, the um, potentially rather bold step of trying to, trying to um, formulate the, 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 this equivalence as a, as, a, as a hypothesis, as a physical hypothesis. We refer to this as the measurement equilibration hypothesis. Nothing more than measurement in an entropy increasing transition to an equ towards an equilibrium state. So this is a very old idea. I don't mean to, this, this is not to, to, to imply some kind of great originality here. It was already present in, in um, Sillard's paper, as, as um, Susanna pointed out earlier. Uh, in fact, um, if you read the paper, my understanding, which is based on the English translation, which according to Zana is quite bad, so... No, it's that's bad. Uh, or in incomplete in some way. Um, so my understanding from, from reading the English translation is really that the Sillard engine um, is in part there to try to, to try to make this point about measurement necessarily being a dissipative process. Zana is nodding, so, uh, so I get, the, I get the, tr the German version stamp of approval. Um, and uh, John von Neumann makes this point also at length in this, in this uh, lovely, if slightly dense, uh, text, early textbook of his. And then, and then many authors have touched on this in various points throughout history. This is a point that keeps recurring and yet, and yet never seems to be picked up and formalized. And that's why I think there's value in trying to give this a name, which and that's, this is the name we've decided for, for better or for worse, the MEH, the Measurement Equilibration Hypothesis. 
Um, in the other paper I showed this uh, by uh, the Gurianova et al. paper, they had three criteria uh, for a good measurement, faithfulness, unbiasedness, and non-invasiveness, which we started referring to in the group as the fun criteria, so now we have the fun paper and the meh paper. But. <laughs> um, yes, so I'm, I keep talking about formali formalizing this, so let's try to formalize this. So if you bear with me, there's a wall of text coming, but let's break it down. So, in the present context, let's try to make a, a version of this that we can kind of get our teeth into. And the version that I would like to present to you is this. Including the observers in the phase space, measurement is an entropy-increasing transition from a system, potentially in superposition, uncorrelated with its environment, to another region of that very large state space that is commensurate with the observers finding a well-defined outcome for the systems. And this should occur in an objective or to perhaps to be more specific, intersubjective manner. Okay, so there we go. This is the, the foundation of what we're trying to do. But immediately we come across a problem, right? And this, I mentioned, I said before, we lack the tools to formalize it, and this is where the tool part comes in, right? We have a, a, a closed system and we have this hypothesis. This immediately leads, leads to two questions. One, how can a closed system equilibrate? Two, how can unitary evolution increase entropy? And the answer, at least the answer that we've uh, uh, um, tried to employ here, one may uh, have a different perspective, which I would love to hear, um, is uh, the notion of equilibration on average. And this is something that's come up in the foundations of st statistical mechanics uh, uh, in, in uh, modern times as a part of the sort of quantum thermodynamics community. And I think it's something that's very um, underappreciated and, and I think something uh, that has, that's very powerful and um, I'm, I would love to develop further. So let me explain what I mean by equilibration on average. Again, uh, a slide with a lot of stuff on it, but please let me break it down. So equilibration on average is perhaps best uh, explained by, by some examples. So in any case, uh, the uh, equilibration average states that the equilibrium state is given by the infinite time average state, the state at the top here. Um, and, and this example of equilibrium, did someone say something? Um, uh, this example of um, equilibration on average, which I think is perhaps the most illustrative, is this one in the middle, equi equilibration of observables. So let's break this statement down. What we have is we say, okay, let's compare the expectation value of some arbitrary observable of the, at the ac of the actual system that we have at, at some, some time t with the expectation value of that observable in the equilibrium state. Take the difference between these two things. And then on average, they are sh like this, as this result shows, for actually for in any case, this average is always smaller than this quantity on the right-hand side. So if one can show, which I'll explain in a second, so if one can show that this quantity on the right-hand side is small, what one has shown is that through the path that this system takes in, in the phase space, if I can, for the sake of uh, argument, if I can take each of these states at each moment in time and put them in a bag, if I reach into that bag and then pull one of these states out, it is very, very likely to be, if this side is small, it's very likely to be indistinguishable with respect to this observable from the equilibrium state. So what is this right-hand side? Okay, well, the first is the operator norm of the, of the observable. All that does is uh, normalize it so that uh, if you're using units where something is large, the, 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 the right-hand and the left-hand side should increase. It just sets your units, basically. Um, the more important part is this thing here, this quantity here called the effective dimension. Uh, and what is the effective dimension? It's the, um, sorry, I'm just checking the time. Yes, good, I'm confused. Um, what is the effective dimension? It's the, it's the sort of the dimensionality of space, state space that you're going to explore through your trajectory. So um, let's take an example. If you start in a, in a uh, uh, energy eigenstate, your effective dimension is one because you're not going to, you have, you're simply going to evolve by a phase and the dimensionality of the, the effective space that you explore through your evolution is simply one. Um, and then the more energy eigenstates you include in your initial state, the more the effective dimension, the greater the state space you're going to be sweeping through as you, as you evolve unitarily. Um, let's ignore the equilibration of subsystems part for now. So um, pictorially, what is, this, what is this equilibration on average result saying? It's saying, sorry, this omega here should be rho infinity, this is the equilibrium state. It's saying that if you, if you look over time, You'll start with whatever expectation value of the observable that, you're, that, that equilibrates, um, whatever it is. It will undergo some evolution, whatever that evolution is. But then after some finite time, some equilibration time, the difference between the actual value that you would observe 
and the, the, the value that's associated with the e equilibrium state is very small. On average, as you go through, there'll be small fluctuations, and then maybe sometimes there'll be large fluctuations, sort of Boltzmann brain type moments. But generally speaking, this difference will be very small. Um, and so why am I such a fan of this idea of equilibration? I, I think it best captures what we classically think of as equilibration. So let's take my favorite example, uh, ideal gas in a box. So you have your box, your ideal gas in it, your particles are all in some corner with some moderately tight distribution of velocities. And then you start the clock, you look away, and then after some time you look back. Now, the, if you take a histogram of the velocities of these particles, if there are enough of them, you will see the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities, right? No, actually you won't. You'll see some single, small, very small deviation from it. And if you have exact knowledge of the constituents and you can pick the moment at which you measure, actually, you can pick a moment where you're arbitrarily far away from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution because you have that degree of preci precise knowledge and control over the individual constituents, which, of course, is not the kind of thing we actually have. That's why thermodynamics works. And that's, it's precisely this idea of uh, why does the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution work as a description of this ideal gas? It's because we don't have that degree of control. It's because the, the averaged version works so well, we simply take that as the actual situation. And so this is effectively a kind of quantum version of that. Um, so this, just to, to drive home the point, I had uh, via entropy maximization in the title of the talk, where does entropy come in? Very good question, to which the answer is incomplete. But part of the answer is the fact that this uh, rho infinity, this equilibrium state, maximizes the, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy, given the constraints of motion. So the more, cons uh, uh, the more sorry, constants, the more constants of motion you have, so you know, take the, the classical example of an integrable system. You have as many constants of motion as you do um, degrees of freedom. You do your action angle variables. Everything's easily solvable. There's no equilibration. Everything's simple. As you, as you start removing constants of motion, you start coming closer to an idea of equilibration. And then once you have no constants of motion whatsoever except the, or no effective constants of motion whatsoever except the energy, then your equilibrium state becomes a thermal state. Um, which is, of course, the state which maximizes the entropy given only that constraint, which is the, 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 the um, average energy is fixed. Um, this point is made at uh, length in this lovely review by Gogolin and Isaac, which if you're interested in this, I recommend you read. Uh, we refer to this um, rather thick review as uh, the Old Testament in our, in our group. <laughs> I was talking to Jens Isaac uh, a month or so ago. Uh, and he, his reply, I told him this, and his reply was, well, what's the New Testament? Um, <laughs> we'll find out, I don't know. Um, just to drive home this point, equilibration is not the same thing as thermalization. There are ways in which one can embed what I'm saying into a thermalization picture, but that requires many more caveats. It requires the consideration of subsystems, et cetera, et cetera. But just generally speaking, if we're going to talk about the whole system, one whole closed system evolving unitarily, then actually thermalization can't do what I've, what I, what I've been talking about because therm in thermalization, you have far too much a many-to-one mapping from your initial states to your equilibrium states. There is, the, for the whole energy surface, only one state, the thermal state. Um, but that is not the only idea of notion of, of, uh, of equilibration. Equilibration is a much more general concept than that. So just to really, really drive home the point, the state does not evolve to the equilibrium state, but rather it becomes, on average, close to it, in fact, indistinguishable from it, with respect to some observables or some subsystems. There will be other observables for which you can perfectly well distinguish the actual state that you have at an actual moment in time from the equilibrium state. And even for the observables which equilibrate on average, just as in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution case, if you can really pick the exact moment of time you're going to measure, even for the equilibrating observables, you will see a difference. It's really trying to encode the notion of a lack of control, a lack of ability to choose exactly the right moment in when you, uh, at which you measure, just as in the classical case. Overall, the evolution is still unitary. And if we're talking about the observable version of equilibration on average, then the system can be closed. A closed system can equilibrate under unitary evolution in this regard. Caveats. Equilibration time I mentioned briefly. There's a whole uh, literature on this. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, if we're going to use this to model measurement, then, um, then uh, uh, this is a very interesting question when we're exploring. This needs to happen quickly. You know, we think, we think uh, uh, collapse is instantaneous. So if this MEH, if this measurement equilibration hypothesis is really something that we can use, then one of the first challenges is to explain 
how we can equilibrate so quickly. Um, another caveat, degeneracy is the version, I didn't, you know, subtle, subtle assumptions snuck in in the slides before. Um, if you include degeneracies, the, you have a sort of degenerate subspace on which you're not going to decohere, you know, an infinite time average. This can be dealt with, these are just technical details, but they, they modify the form of the equation slightly. Um, third, recurrences. Uh, of course, you're going to have recurrences in this picture, but that exactly is one, one should. And in fact, this is one way to deal with recurrences. If you demand that, that uh, in contrary to the statement at the top, if you instead demand that you deterministically evolve towards the equilibrium state, then of course you can never have it recur recurrences. Um, and then the other is that you need to argue for, for why an effective dimension is large. And there's a lot of literature on explaining why in large, generic, complex systems one would expect uh, to have a large effective dimension. Um, the time tells me that I've run out of time, but my timer tells me I've only been going for 25 minutes. So I'm a little confused. How much longer should I go for? Yes, I would very much, very much like to get to questions. Okay, so um, just to, uh, I'll speed through the last bits. Okay, so now we've, we've laid this groundwork, we've set this up. So now we can ask uh, perhaps the simplest, oversimple in fact, most basic question. We have this, this idea that should somehow should represent, this state structure which somehow should represent objectivity or intersubjectivity. When can we equilibrate to this? When can this be the equilibrium state? And the answer in fact is never. Asterisk, okay, technically if you start in the state, <laughs> and you give yourself a Hamiltonian, which is an eigenstate of that, then technically this will be the equilibrium state, but that's not really in the spirit of what we're talking about. So let's just go with never. Um, in fact, we prove a more general uh, a, a impossibility for a more general state than the SBS. If you have a classical quantum state, so-called classical quantum state, and demand orthogonality of the environments, the, the conditional environments, this also is enough to, to show you, you can never do this. So exact measurements are impossible under the measurement equilibration hypothesis. It's not surprising that it's impossible, actually. This paper I mentioned before by Yelena, Nico, and Marcus, they already pointed this out, but they made the assumption that you can't have a sort of zero temperature bath, this, this, uh, this uh, unobtainable ideal thing that, which breaks the third law of thermodynamics. What's interesting is, in our case, even if you allow yourself that, it's still not, not possible. Um, and then, out of interest, one might take the... So this von Neumann picture I showed before, this requires a certain form of Hamiltonian. Just to see what happens, you can throw this in and ask what's the equilibrium state if this is what's going to be generating your evolution. And, and very interestingly, you find no correlations between your, your system and your environment. So this, ha this Hamiltonian cannot um, be the end of the story somehow for if, if one is going to see this as an equilibration picture. Of course, it's playing a role. This is the Hamiltonian, for example, of the first step of the stern gerlach apparatus. I'm not trying to say that this Hamiltonian is not... This form of Hamiltonian doesn't, doesn't feature in measurement, but for, at least for the equilibration part, that's, it's clearly not enough. But... We're asking too much here. This is a way, way too strict requirement. We've asked that we exactly equilibrate to this SBS state. We haven't even allowed a little control in the form of this sort of uh, von measurement type uh, Hamiltonian before then demanding equilibration. And so uh, I'm going to really speed through this just to relax. So we relax the, relax the first point. We say, OK, let's assume this nice conditional form Hamiltonian that says, if the system is in the state I, this will happen. If in the system is in the state some other state J, this other thing will happen. Seems like a re reasonable way to describe a measurement situation. And on top of that, we coarse grain the observers in the following way. We bunch all of the systems together to form sort of macro observers. What's the justification of this? Well, it's kind of too much to demand that every single spin in your photon detector uh, knows whether there was a photon or not. What you just need is, let's say, the moral equivalent of magnetic domain somehow to encode this. And in fact, the question of the transition, how big your coarse graining needs to be in order to have this representation is in itself an interesting question. But then you can actually approximate, approximately equilibrate to this sort of objective or intersubjective state structure. Uh, and in fact, you do so um, exponentially well. This is, a, uh, so this is the, the fidelity between two sort of conditional states of your, of your observer. Um, uh, you do so exponentially well. This is some positive constant, depends on the initial state. Uh, and this here is the number of systems you've bunched together into a given sort of macro observer. So that is to say, the more spins you, you parcel together into your magnet, magnet, magnetic domain, as you parcel spins together into sort of a, morally speaking, magnetic domain, you will exponentially uh, get closer to this um, SBS uh, objective uh, state structure. OK, so to summarize, the, this, this hypothesis resolves the thermodynamic problems associated with measurement. 
And I think it helps us address this conceptual issue of when to model a process as a projection and when to model it as a, as a unitary, this optical table example I gave. In our model, when is, when is it the case that you can, you can uh, uh, use this? Then it's, well, if there is a conditional uh, interaction with a, with a much larger or much more complex system, then that tells you that's the case where you should be using a, a, a projection. And also, these ideal projected measurements are impossible, but they can be approximated exponentially well. And the coarse graining plays a role in that. What's the outlook? Well, the model was incredibly simple, incredibly restrictive. We could allow for some initial unitary control. Some people call this pre-measurement, um, among a number of other possible extensions. What about POVMs? What about continuous variables? What are the energetics of this process? Um, can we use this kind of thing to examine measurement paradoxes? In, indeed, uh, some, some collaborators of mine, Veronica Bauman and Tom Rivlin, are, are working on exactly this question at the moment. Um, and then I think some maybe more important questions. We need a good way to quantify entropy increases in the equilibration on average picture. And this is something that's the, the I mean, this, this may be my ignorance, but I find the, the lit, this is, uh, seems to be a hole in the literature, um, which I'm very, very interested in. And, and I, I have some things in process uh, maybe trying to, 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 at least in part, fill this hole. But, um, but there may be some things, that, some work that I'm unaware of. It seems very strange to me that, that it seems so poorly quantified in this in the literature. But again, I stress that may just be my ignorance. I haven't found. They might just be that I haven't found the right things yet. Um, a second thing, which I think is perhaps more important, is uh, to apply to actual models of actual measurement devices, sort of photon detectors. So there was this question before by, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the, whose name it was. I don't think he's here anyway. Um, about um, uh, why you need to prepare, why you need to cool down your, your photon detectors so much. And I gave the answer because you need to, if, if this is the way one should view measurement, then you need to prepare this highly out of equilibrium situation. And the, the more out of equilibrium it is, the more sensitivity perhaps you'll have. This is, all, this is a very fuzzy thing. So making this more concrete would be nicer. Uh, and then third, how to falsify the hypothesis. What's the point of formulating it as a hypothesis if it's not something that can be falsified? Like, so uh, I gave um, equilibration time as an example of this. If one, cannot, one simply cannot arrive at a picture where the equilibration can happen fast enough, such that it, it accords with what we understand of as the speed of measurement, Hypothesis is finished, we need to start again. That would be, I mean, obviously, I don't want that, but that would still be great. That would be, that would be, that would be a progress in our, in our understanding. So, so with that, um, I'd like to point out my collaborators and thank them. Uh, Felix Binders here in the crowd, you've pr probably met him. This is Manu Schwartz, hands on the left here. This is Marcus Huber looking more serious than you will ever see him looking. Um, and on top of that, we have uh, additional funding from the John Templeton Foundation and also from the Austrian Science Fund. As I mentioned yesterday, the Austrian Science Fund do, I think, a very good job of um, funding foundational research, and I think that should really be appreciated and, and, uh, and uh, acknowledged. Uh, if you're interested, please read the paper. And finally, a quick advertisement for a con conference that, we're, that Felix and I are organizing in Dublin with a, with a number of other collaborators and organizers, the Emergence of Classicality, New Perspectives on Measurements in Quantum Theory, 15th to 19th of July. So if you're interested in discussing this and other, other related issues, then please do come by.